The first time I ever saw a speaker enclosure with a passive radiator in it, I thought it was a scam. And that is our first myth. This is a passive radiator. It's not a fake cone. There's no scam going on. This little device right here actually serves a purpose. So a passive radiator is a speaker cone without a magnet on the back or a voice coil. In this video, we're gonna learn a lot about passive radiators and bust a few more myths, so keep on watching. Back in the day, a lot of your car audio companies made these underseat enclosures that looked a lot like this JBL right here that I'll put up on the screen. These things would have an active driver, usually a small cone, like a six inch or a five and a quarter, and they would pair it with a passive radiator. And of course, my first First reaction back in the 90s when I was flipping through a crutch field and looking at these things was what the heck why are you trying to sell me a box with a fake speaker cone in it if it has room for two regular speaker cones why not put two regular speakers in it well it turns out a passive radiator is not a scam it's not just an extra cone there for decoration a passive radiator acts a lot like a port as best I can tell kicker was actually the first company to start making these things for car use they would put a passive radiator and an active driver in a very thin enclosure that was designed to go behind the seat in a regular cab pickup truck. They were doing this way back in the 1970s. So a passive radiator is nothing new. In fact, Kicker has brought back the passive radiator enclosure. They're now putting passive radiators in these thin boxes that are designed to be down firing in a rear hatch. Now, passive radiators have been around for a long time. They were patented by a guy named Harry Olson way back in 1935. Now, Harry Olson's someone you might like to know more about. Harry was a bit of a legend in the early audio days. He held dozens of patents covering all kinds of exciting things. He probably had about a dozen patents on microphones, including the shotgun microphone. He patented a couple of different horn loudspeakers. He even patented a woofer surround. And if you just learned something new, do me a favor and hit that like button. Olson actually called his passive radiator a drone cone. Passive radiators go by several different names. Sometimes people just call them passive cones or passive for short. They've been called assisted base radiators. Myth number two, when designing your passive radiator enclosure, you're gonna need two passive radiators for every active driver. I learned about this myth from reading the comments on my videos. One of the first enclosures I built on my channel was some of these. I used an eight inch passive radiator and an eight inch woofer. And my comments just blew up. Apparently I needed two of these things. Well, that is not true. The reality is that the passive cone has to be able to displace twice the volume of air as the active cone. So if you've got an eight inch active and an eight inch passive, your passive is gonna have to have twice the X max of your active. That way you can displace twice the volume of air. That's what Kicker is doing on their current generation of passive radiator enclosures. They've got an active and a passive of the exact same size and the passive has more throw, it can displace more volume. And you can reach that double volume any way you want. You can do a little mix and match. You can take a smaller woofer and a larger passive. Right here's a chart with the surface area of some common woofer sizes. As you can see on the chart, an eight inch has about 219 square centimeters of surface area. Now some are more and some are less because every woofer is just a little bit different. Now your typical 12 has about 515 square centimeters of surface area. So you could take an eight inch active and a 12 inch passive and if they had the exact same X max, that 12 would pair well with that eight. Or you can use a single active that's both larger and has more X max. To find the volume of air displaced by either the active or the passive, you start off by taking the X max, which is usually in millimeters and multiply that by 0.1 to convert it to centimeters, and then take that number and multiply it by the surface area of the cone. That tells you how much air your active driver is gonna displace on one forward stroke, and now your passive just needs to be able to displace twice that amount of air. So where did this rule of thumb come from? It's all based around the suspension of the passive radiator. Now the suspension for both the passive and the active is comprised of two things. The first thing is the surround right here, and the second thing is the spider. Now the passive radiator needs a very compliant or soft suspension. Now what you have to remember about the suspension of either this or an active driver, the further you push the cone, the more effort it takes to push the cone. And what you wanna do is make sure that the pressure required to move the cone on your passive radiator is linear. Let's say it takes some amount of pressure to move the cone one millimeter. Well, if you move the cone an additional millimeter, you want it to take the same amount of pressure. And eventually you reach a point where the suspension gets really tight and it takes even more pressure to move the cone by a millimeter. At that point, your cone movement's non-linear and your passive radiator's gonna start to sound bad. Now I made that mistake on the very first passive radiator enclosure that I ever built. 
And what I've learned since then is to always follow that rule of thumb as close as possible and go ahead and model it in WinISD so that you can make sure both your woofer and your passive are gonna stay linear. I learned from that mistake and I use this exact passive right here in this box right here. I tuned that thing really, really low and it could get down to 20 hertz without making any noise whatsoever. I'll make sure to give you a link to the videos up here somewhere, wherever it goes up here. The next myth is that you need to add weights to the back of your passive radiator. Again, this is another myth that I picked up reading comments on my videos. There's no law that says that you need to put weights on the back of a passive radiator. Some passive have a spot for weights on the front, but most of them do have a hole in the back where you can thread in a screw and add some weights. So what are the weights on the back of a passive radiator used for? These are used to tune the subwoofer enclosure. It works a lot like changing the length of a port on a ported subwoofer enclosure. When you add more weights, you get a lower tuning frequency. When you take weight away, you get a higher tuning frequency. And again, there's no law that says you actually have to use weight because what you should be doing is shooting for some specific tuning frequency. What you've got to remember is the cone itself has mass. It also has weight. And that's going to limit your ability to tune it. You can't take away the cone. It's always possible that the cone itself has the weight you need to get the tuning frequency you're shooting for. Now to understand how passive radiators work, it'll help to understand a little bit about how ports work. So right here, I've got a three inch port and this section is about a foot long. If I wanted to tune my box lower, I could do that by making the port longer. So now my port is about two feet long. And what you've got to remember about this port is this port is filled with air. It's not an empty tube. It actually has something in it and that air has mass. When I go from a one foot port to a two foot port, I double the amount of mass that's in that port. On the inside of the enclosure, the subwoofer starts moving air and that causes a resonance and that resonance causes the air mass inside of the port to start pumping back and forth so that the outside of the port, which is coupled to the outside air, starts to make sound waves the exact same way that your speaker cone is going to make sound waves. So don't think about a port as an empty tube. Think about a port as a slug of air that has some known mass. And as that mass moves back and forth, it makes sound. In other words, a port is just a speaker cone made out of air. That is how and why a passive radiator works. It uses the exact same principle. And as you add more weights, it's harder to push that cone, which means it's going to resonate at a lower frequency. I'll dive a little bit deeper into how a port works later on in the video, so keep watching. The other thing to remember about a port is that as the opening of the port gets larger, the port has to get longer to maintain the same tuning frequency. And as the enclosure gets smaller, the port has to get longer to maintain the same tuning frequency. Now the cone of your passive radiator is analogous to the opening of your port. So if you were to switch from a small passive to a large passive, the large passive is going to need more weight. Now it also already comes with more weight because it has a big heavy cone. If you wanted to tune lower, you'd need to add more weight. And if you put your passive in a smaller enclosure, you would need to add more weight. The next myth is that passive radiators are only useful in small enclosures. And that's not an actual myth. I just wanted to talk about why you only see passive radiators in small enclosures. Passive radiators are not very cost effective. Sometimes they can cost as much as the active driver. The only time it really makes sense to use the passive is if you have a small enclosure. And that's because it's difficult to get a port to fit into a small enclosure. This goes back to port design. As the size of an enclosure gets smaller, you need a longer port. For example, I've got this enclosure that I built a couple of years ago for a six and a half inch tank band subwoofer. That's the big brother to this little guy right here. The port in this thing is almost two feet long. If I wanted to tune it lower, I would need to make the port even longer. If I wanted to make the box even smaller, I'd need to make the port even longer. So it gets really difficult to get loud low bass out of a small ported enclosure because all these factors drive you to making ever longer ports. And as those ports get longer, it becomes nearly impossible to fit them in the enclosure. That is where passive radiators really shine. Now I built this as part of the Sound Advice live stream boombox build off. If you're not familiar with the Sound Advice live stream, it's Nick from Toys DIY Audio and I, we jump on YouTube every Monday night around seven o'clock and we do a live stream. We'd love to have have you watch the live stream sometime. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know the next time we go live. Now this boom box uses this five and a quarter inch tang band driver and this eight inch passive radiator. And there's no way you could have gotten low bass out of that small kind of oblong shape 
without going with a passive radiator. So situations like that are where the passive really shines. It's just more cost effective to go the ported route. To learn more about ports and how they work, check out this playlist right here. I couldn't make videos like this without the support of my patrons. Right here are my $10 patrons with a special shout out to $25 patrons, Dylan and Ben. If you would like to help me make these videos, you can support DIY audio content by checking the link down in the description.